This video is supported by Brilliant.org. World War I, arguably the worst war of all time, was started by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. I say it was arguably the worst war because more people did die in World War II, but any war where you have both horses and tanks on the same battlefield is pretty messed up. But Franz Ferdinand's death was partly because of his own ill-fated decision. He was visiting Sarajevo in preparation for his country annexing the country of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there were some people there that didn't necessarily care for that deal, so they decided to kill him. They attacked his motorcade earlier in the day with a hand grenade. Luckily for him, the hand grenade bounced off of his car and hit another car. Unluckily for the people in that car, that's where it exploded and injured some of them. So the Archduke and his wife, they survived unharmed and went on with their daily plans of ceremonial meetings and the like, I guess because assassinations were just something that happened all the time back then. Now the security detail did change the route that they were going to be taking through the rest of the day to avoid some other incident happening, but Franz Ferdinand decided he wanted to go to the hospital and visit some of the people that were injured in the attack earlier, which kind of took them right past one part of the route that they were originally scheduled to go down. And coincidentally, standing at that exact same spot was Gavrilo Princep, one of the conspirators who had signed up to assassinate him earlier. He pulls out his gun, shoots the Archduke and his wife dead. Now this led Austria-Hungary to declare war on bosnia Herzegovina. All their allies jumped in to protect their homies, and so began the war to end all wars. A war that killed 16 million people. Now again, more people died in World War II. 60 million died in World War II, but it could be argued that the end of World War I, the terms in that deal set the stage for World War II, so you could also say 76 million people died because of this one man's decision. Now, of course, it can be debated, and has been debated for over 100 years, that if it wasn't Franz Ferdinand's death that something else would have kicked off World War I, that Europe was a crumbling house of cards of imperial alliances that was going to fall apart at some point eventually. So that would mean that Franz Ferdinand's decision didn't actually make any difference at all, that all of this was predetermined. This is the heart of determinism. This is the idea that everything is predetermined, that the story's already been written, we're just kind of riding a wave across it, that everything you've ever done and everything you ever will do is set, and that there's no free will. Of course, this goes totally against the experience of life. You know, we feel like we have agency, we have moments of pure spontaneity. Surely there's a way to make conscious decisions that work outside of some quasi-religious deterministic framework. After all, you can see one person's decisions to work harder, to set goals, to, to you know, take risks, winding up giving them a different life than somebody who doesn't take risks, who doesn't have goals, who just kind of settles and is lazy. But these decisions, are we making them? Science is starting to argue that maybe we're not. Maybe there's another entity behind the wheel. An entity that resides in our own brains. We live in divisive times. There's no question about it. Whether you're talking about politics, what kind of phone you use, what kind of car you drive, everybody has an opinion on it. And the stronger the opinion, well, the more right you must be. What I'm talking about in this video has come up from time to time on this channel, and the reason why it keeps coming up is because I think this is important. You know, the more our political and social discourse is directed by our beliefs, the more important it is for us to understand where these beliefs are coming from. And just because I think this is interesting as hell. So let's start with a little bit of brain anatomy. Luckily, I've got a brain right here that I borrowed from a, a kid in my neighborhood. No one will miss him. The human brain, and most animal brains for that matter, is made up of two hemispheres, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And because nature was drunk somewhere along the way, it got kind of cross-wired. So the right hemisphere actually controls the left side of your body and vice versa. So if you wanted to make a guy hit himself with his left hand because he, say, you know, snickered at you when you tripped while you were out walking your dog, for example, you would just need to tap on the motor cortex on the right side, like that. Why are you hitting yourself, Billy? <laughs> Why are you hitting yourself? Now, of course, these two hemispheres need to talk to each other, and they do that through a band of nerves called the corpus callosum. I would show you on this brain, but it's not, it's not real. It's fake. I was just kidding. I didn't take it from a neighborhood kid. I left it in his skull. Now, scientists have known for a long time that different areas of the brain generally control different functions. There's a language center, a visual cortex, etc. And some of these modules, like the language center, reside on only one hemisphere. A lot of this was learned by various brain traumas that were observed over the years. So now fast forward to the 1960s when scientists started experimenting with a new surgery to help treat people with severe epilepsy. And the treatment's pretty simple. They just 
cut the corpus callosum, also known as a corpus callosotomy. The idea was that epileptic seizures were caused by massive misfirings of signals across the brain, so if you cut off the communication pipeline between the two hemispheres, you can at the very least localize the seizure and prevent it from being completely debilitating. Now this was an extreme procedure and it was for only the most extreme cases, people who got hundreds of seizures a day and literally couldn't function anymore, and for whom drugs didn't work at all. And for many people it worked. And for others, it created some really weird side effects, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. One patient who went by the name Vicky said that going to the grocery store was about a three hour ordeal because she would say, grab the lettuce with her right hand and then the left hand would literally swat it out. Or she might reach for the cereal with one hand and the other hand would literally <laughs> grab her other hand and stop her from grabbing it. It's like the two were fighting for control. Apparently picking out clothes in the morning was a similar situation and sometimes she would wind up just wearing multiple sets of clothes because that's the only way she could get out of the house. Stories like this got the attention of neurobiologist Richard Sperry at the California Institute of Technology, so he started running some tests on them to figure out what was going on. He started by simply testing out how different sides of the brain respond to different kinds of stimuli. For example, he would put the patients in a setup where their eyes saw two different things. They basically split their field of view. Show the right eye a picture of a chicken, and the patients would just say they see a chicken because the language center resides in the left half of the brain. But when he showed the left eye a picture of the chicken, the patient would say they couldn't see anything because the right side of the brain doesn't have a language center. Therefore, it didn't know what it was looking at. But when they performed a version of the experiment where the patient was shown an image and then had to select that image from a selection of other images, they could do that. And when they took the test even further and asked people to draw what they saw, they could do that as well. So basically they would show these people a picture on their left eye and they would say that they couldn't see anything, but then their left hand would draw the thing that they couldn't see. I mean, just think about this for a second. You're taking this test and they cover your right eye and you look at something and you just see a blank screen and then your hand just starts drawing something that you didn't even know was there. That's crazy weird. But maybe the weirdest part of the story is that when they asked people why they drew what they drew, even though they didn't see anything, they always had a reason that they were able to give. If the person drew a chicken, they might say it was because they ate chicken earlier in the day. And in one specific case, the guy drew a bell. And when they asked why he drew a bell, he said with absolute certainty that it was because they drove past a church where the bell was ringing on their way to the experiment lab. This became a subject of particular interest to Sperry's protege, Michael Gazagana, who deduced that there was an interpreter module of the brain whose job it was to justify the decisions and actions of the subconscious modules and interpret that for the conscious mind. And in his research, he showed time and time again that people's attitudes, decisions, worldviews were all created in the subconscious mind and then justified by an interpreter module that, to put it frankly, lies its ass off because it's not the job of the interpreter module to suss out the truth. Its job is to create a coherent conscious experience. The nerves send signals to the subconscious parts of the brain, which process it, send it to the interpreter parts of the brain, which interprets it to the conscious part of the brain. And if there's any gaps there, if there's any information missing, it just makes up whatever it needs to, to continue the conscious experience that your mind is having. You know those times when you have a perfectly healthy chicken and broccoli thing in your fridge, but you're just kind of craving something bad, and then you start to kind of justify to yourself that like, you know, well, you know, there's a Wendy's right next to the Lowe's, and I had been meaning for like a year now to go look at paint swatches for the bathroom, and you know, I mean, I could eat the healthy thing in the fridge, but then, you know, I, damn it, I wouldn't get to see those swatches. And you wind up getting the bad stuff, and you know the whole time that you're completely full of shit. Yeah, this is actual proof of your inner bullshitter. In more psychological terms, this is a part of the ego. Now, when we hear the term ego, we often associate it with vanity or narcissism, but the actual psychological sense of ego is defined as the part of the mind that mediates between the conscious and the unconscious and is responsible for reality testing and a sense of personal identity. The ego's job is to make sense of the world around us and to establish our place in it. Again, it is not beholden to the truth, only coherence the smooth conscious continuity of our consciousness. Which is why as much as we love to think that we are logical creatures that make our decisions based off of data and information and we make rational decisions based off of that, nothing could be further from the truth. We make decisions at a subconscious level, much closer to the more animal limbic system. And then we justify and interpret those decisions before it ever becomes conscious thought. And we interpret those decisions in whatever way makes the most sense to our current egoic understanding of the world. And let's face it, every one of us does this all day, every day. 
We are 24 seven bullshitters. We justify selfish and self-centered behavior, arguing that it's actually good for the world and other people in some way. We protect our egos from outside information that doesn't jibe with our current worldview, often discrediting the source of the information if we have to. This all happens unconsciously, under the surface. By the time it becomes conscious thought, the bullshitting has already taken place. And it all looks like perfectly rational thought to us. And this is why this subject fascinates me so much. You know, in our, in our current divisive cultural and political climate, it is more important than ever that we understand why we think the way we do. By understanding there are hidden forces at work inside of our own brains kind of gives us a little bit of space where you can objectively look at your thoughts and, you know, adjust your beliefs accordingly. Because free will, it ain't what it used to be. Turns out the world is probably not deterministic at all. What we do matters. We can affect the future. Our actions have consequences. But that doesn't mean we're completely in charge of our actions. There's a whole mess of stuff going on behind the scenes, interpreter modules and subconscious stuff, giving you a version of the truth that they think that you want to hear. It's up to us to be aware of our thought processes and understand them for what they really are. Not entirely ours. Apply a little skepticism to your own mind and your own thoughts. And don't judge other people too harshly. They're only halfway in charge too. But if you really want to take your logical thinking to the next level, one great place to start is the logic program at brilliant.org. Brilliant's logic course sharpens your inner Sherlock Holmes by walking you through word problems and showing you how you can come to accurate logical conclusions with very little information using the power of deduction. Do you know how many people can't pick up on context clues in this world? It's scary. Having this power supercharged in yourself gives you a huge advantage. And that's what Brilliant is really good at. Instead of just throwing facts and figures at you, they teach you how to think like a scientist, or detective in this case, helping you to figure out the answers yourself so you can apply those more easily in your daily life. You can sign up for Brilliant at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get free access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And if you want to get the premium subscription, the first 200 people that sign up get the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses for 20% off your subscription for life. Take Brilliant for a spin. I think you'll like it. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe links downstairs. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting this video and a big huge thanks to the answer files on Patreon that help make all this possible and are just creating an awesome community. You can join them by going to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. But first I want to give a big thanks to all the people who just signed up recently. Let me take care of their names real quick. We got Gregory Walker, Matthew Keys, Jeremy Cart, Richard A. Furman, Songor Mark Harvath, Dan C. Morris, uh, Tim Ames, Samuel Price, Don Banks, Alma, Andy Middleton, Brock Peterson, Andrew S. Bernard, the Nard Dog, uh, Daryl Julian, and Joaquim Carlson. Thank you guys so much. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, uh, check out some of my other videos. I think you might like those too. And if you do, hit subscribe and you'll be the first one to see them every Monday. Cool shirts available at the store, answers at joe.com slash shirts. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.